Hi, I'm Mike Haddock, and today we're in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and we're at the Albright Library, and it's built out of limestone. And I have with me Wayne Faree, who was a carver at the Washington National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. And he's going to give us some info on how they built these buildings. Now, I know a little bit from when I worked, but he was the actual carver down there, and he's going to give us some really good insight. I was one of many carvers at the National Cathedral. There was quite a few of us. But I learned a lot about the trade, and we want to talk today about the Scranton Albright Memorial Library. Now, the library was uh, donated and built by a fellow named John Joseph Albright. Uh, and the building was built from 1891 to 1893. That's a lot of work for two years. And the cost of this building was $125,000. I'm thinking the cost of a building like this today is going to be in the millions, probably over $20 million to build this today. Maybe more, probably more. At any rate, we're here today, and uh, this building was designed by Green and Wicks Architects out of Buffalo. And it's a copy of a French chateau monastery, which is now used as a museum in France, the museum, the Cluny Museum. It's an early Renaissance style with some, with some Gothic details on it. And this building was built by Conrad Schroeder, who came to America when he was 19 from Gunster Bloom, Germany. And he formed a company here and built a lot of the buildings here in Scranton. We're in the Gothic uh, section, historical section of Scranton. It's, there are so many wonderful stone buildings around. It's just incredible. I consider this one of the real gems of the Scranton area. It's a beautiful building. And uh, this fellow, uh, Conrad Schroeder, at one point he had 400 employees. So this was a big deal back then. There was a lot of stonework going on. There was all kinds of great craftsmen. Uh, and so we're here today to look at this building. It is a beauty. So come along with us and we'll show you about this building. So one of the things Wayne is going to talk about is the grain of the stone. When they're carving stone, Wayne, how do they approach that? Well, limestone is a very durable and plentiful stone for building and it comes out of Indiana. That's why it's called Indiana Limestone. And the proper way to set stones out of Indiana Limestone is with the bed of the stone. Now you can see that this stone is, is pretty well weathered and you can really see the striations. They're going horizontal. That's how you lay traditionally limestone because it's going to weather better that way, because it comes out of the ground that way. The striations run horizontal. And limestone is an excellent building material. This, this building is now 129 years old. And uh, you can see it's, it's just wonderful. There's been some restorations on it. I think it's been repointed. That means uh, the mortar was, was redone. I think it was recently too, <clears throat> but uh, it, the thing is with stone, if it's protected from the water, it will last for centuries. And uh, so that's, I think, our main point. <clears throat> what we wanted to say: there's different grades of limestone. Now, if you look at, at the carving, this is probably more of a statuary grade of limestone. That means it's got a tighter grain to it, which uh, in, makes it more conducive to getting your smooth, your smooth uh, cuts and it holds an edge better. So I think that's kind of what we're looking at here. Back in the day, uh, limestone was plentiful and it was uh, being worked by literally thousands and thousands of craftsmen. Uh, today, things are a little different. The whole quarry situation is uh, it's much more expensive now. Uh, there's been some economical and financial problems uh, with the limestone. But it's still, it's still available and it's still an excellent product to make a building out of. Now, this little guy 
he's sort of like uh, coming out of the foliage and he's kind of got a menacing little look. And uh, of course, gargoyles are very popular. He's not really a gargoyle. He's just sort of a grotesque little monster. And it's just kind of interesting and it's, and it's fun. And so I'm gonna recreate this to give you an idea of how, of how these things were done. It looks like somebody's painted in the eye, maybe with a magic marker. That's probably more likely some sort of a graffiti artist, which I'm glad they haven't done anything to this building, because this building is wonderful. So anyway, that's what we're going to do, and if you're interested in seeing how that's done, tune in to my uh, YouTube channel, and we'll have a video on that. Okay, we're just going to talk a little bit about how this limestone weathers. Uh, but first, I think we need to talk about what limestone is really made out of. Limestone was a prehistoric ocean bed. And it's made out of really tiny little micro sea creatures. And you can see the, the high points on this. Looks very granular. Those are the little uh, crustaceans that got buried into this uh, sedimentary stone. And all the rest gets worn away first. And then what's remaining is these little teeny shells and so that's why you have that sort of granulated effect when you look at it. Now it looks like this stone was uh, damaged at some point. It could have been uh, uh, a gardening tool or, or, or anything like that and what they've done here is they've cut a piece and they've mortared it in. Of course it's not a very good job. The mortar's not a good match. Uh, it's, mortar has kind of come out of the little crack here. But this is referred to as a Dutchman patch. When a piece of stone is cut <clears throat> to replace a damaged area, they'll square out a piece with, uh, with chisels, and then they'll cut another piece that fits in there, and then they'll mortar it or glue it in place. And so that's how that's done. This, the stones down here is what, we, what they refer to as a water table. And uh, it's usually made out of a harder stone than the limestone. You want to keep the limestone up and out of the water so it doesn't deteriorate as fast. But what we're seeing here is what's referred to as molding. And uh, these back in the day were, were done sometimes by hand, but usually uh, what, by a tool that's referred to as a planer. <clears throat> and a planer is a bed it travels under a tool and it scrapes away a shape with a blade that's shaped to the shape that you're after in the stone. We have a negative blade, the opposite of this shape, and that cuts away layer by layer, like about an eighth of an inch to three thirty seconds of an inch at a time. And eventually you get down to what you're after. Now we're looking at uh, some of the ashlar stones in this building and it's got a texture on it that was made by a handheld chisel that's referred to as a point. It's basically a chisel that has a point on it and the uh, stone cutter uses his hammer to make chips in the stone and it gives this really nice texture. Now, uh, we're going to talk about uh, these pilasters, columns, that come up. And when you say pilaster, what you mean is like a column, only it's a, a two- or three-sided column. You don't see the back side of the column. It's incorporated into the building. But these, uh, these uh, pilaster columns culminate into this Gothic design. And uh, up top, you see the three carvings and then there's another three smaller carvings and then at the top is the finial. Those uh, designs are referred to as crockets. It's a typical gothic design and uh, they're referred to as crockets. Now here we're at one of the windows uh, opposite the entry at the Albright Library and what we're seeing here are also this uh, pilaster molding around the window. It culminates in the peak with another uh, finial. Uh, and then down here at the bottom, uh, 
These are referred to as, as gable or molding termination carvings. A lot of times at the bottom of a window surround, you'll find uh, these termination carvings and they're usually some de decorative ornament. In this case, this is incorporated into a really big piece of stone. This stone goes all the way from here all the way over to here. That's a really large stone. And then it goes back, all the way back and into the building. This is also part of it, all of this. So this was a huge stone. There's a lot of work into this. There's molding underneath. There's molding here, and then this is sloped to drain the water off, and then this goes right into the building. So this stone is a good two, two, two feet, uh, maybe a little better. And uh, that's just uh, really a <coughs> phenomenal thing. You see the windows are leaded glass. This is lead soldered here and here. And uh, these windows have been modernized at some point, but inside this building is just some fantastic architectural ornamentation, including a lot of stained glass windows. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the things I love so much about these buildings is these wonderful, wonderfully designed lions. And uh, they're probably uh, two foot nine, something like that. And uh, they're just really gorgeous. See how regal they are? They're highly stylized. Uh, the main is got some really nice curves in it. And <clears throat> it just has a really regal posture. I love these lines. Hopefully at some point I'll be able to recreate these. Right. Now we're still in Scranton. We're actually still on the sidewalk next to the Scranton Albright Library. But right across the street is what used to be the Scranton Central High School. And this is also a wonderful uh, gem of a building. It's in the Gothic uh, section of Scranton. And you can see the, the beautiful ornamentation and the way that, and the beautiful masonry work on this building. It's just absolutely fantastic. Uh, now, early on in the same uh, time that uh, uh, Mr. Schroeder was working stone, he had a fellow working for him named Frank Carlucci. And uh, Frank Carlucci started his own business, I think, in 1894. And he was actually the mason that put this gem together. Now, here's the entryway uh, where I, uh, apparently back then uh, the, the genders were segregated in the high school. But this was a girl's entryway. And uh, if you look down at the bottom, you can see these sort of seafoam green uh, watershed stones, which I believe were blue stone, and they've been patched, uh, I think, within the last 10 or 10 or 15 years. And it looks like they did a pretty good job, but they were weathering pretty pretty well. Uh, but the building is, I mean, you, you look at this building, you don't see any cracks in the stones. It's absolutely fantastic engineering and craftsmanship. You can see that uh, on either side of the windows and on either side of this uh, finial, another finial, another gothic finial, this, this stonework is what's referred to as tracery. And that's a typical gothic feature. Now, the, the majority of this building, I think, is not limestone. The bottom, the bottom tier, the bottom floor is limestone, but up above, it's what I believe is West Mountain Stone. And it's a sort of a yellow sandstone. It's fairly hard. And you can see just the beautiful craftsmanship that was involved in, in, in this building. And, and just look at this thing, how well built it was. And how uh, professionally dressed the stones are. Now if you walk, watch Mike Haddock's videos, you can see how the stones are dressed by breaking them with uh, chisels and hammers. And, it's just a wonderful thing. It's beautiful. Now, since we're down and been talking about the Scranton Memorial Albright Library and the original Scranton High School, uh, now we're here at the Masonic Temple, which was built by the Scottish Rite, and it's a cathedral. 
And you can see the wonderful Gothic uh, design. This is also in the Gothic district of Scranton. And it's absolutely amazing. But what we wanted to talk about here is what happens when water is not properly drained away from the building. And, and right up above this damage, you can see what was called the tracery work. In this case, it's sort of this little balustrade around this uh, little portico that comes off here. And uh, you can see how it really is in some deep need of repair. The motor's gone. Uh, it's been redone at some point where it's reset uh, askew and that uh, was never properly put back in place. Uh, and then also it's extremely weathered because it's pretty much out in the open here. <coughs> but you can see what happens when, when you have this intricate uh, tracery work and uh, maybe there were too many pieces incorporated. I'm not sure, but we can see that there's a lot of damage here. And here, uh, we live in Pennsylvania where we have a, a freeze thaw cycle. And uh, sometimes when water isn't controlled properly, we get this breaking up of the stone, which is referred to as spalling. Now, if we were to repair this, we could either cut another stone, cut this out, and cut another stone and replace it with mortar around it, which I think would be the, the thing to do. But we could also break away the damaged part and reconstruct this with reconstructive mortars. Now, Mike and I are still at the Albright Library and we're gonna look further up on the building and you're gonna see some decorative uh, gargoyle carvings up top. I don't believe that I don't believe that they were functional gargoyles, but I could be wrong. It could be that right between their legs was a way for water to get off the roof. But I want to bring that to the attention of the viewer. Uh, if you like gargoyles and you've got some free time and you're in the area, come down and look at these wonderful ornamentations on this building. We want to thank Wayne for giving it all his insights on that building at the library. But not only that, he came back and like he said, he was gonna recarve that grotesque, you call it, right? Yeah, it's, a, it's referred to as a grotesque or a little Gothic beast that was incorporated into a lot of the carvings in the Gothic uh, construction yep. back in the day. So on his YouTube channel, he recreated this. And you wanna say just a little thing about how you started and ended it? Well, we talked about recreating these little guys on the either side of the entryway of the Albright Memorial Library in Scranton Gothic uh, Building District. And uh, I measured out, uh, I measured the actual stone. Now, if we were gonna recreate this stone, it was a, it's a big stone. I mean, and, it's, and it goes all the way down to here. I, I think it's probably, oh, maybe 20 inches or more. And then, it, and then it goes way over here too. We were actually going to recreate this. We'd have to do a lot more measuring. It's a huge stone. But I did take the measurements for it. I was planning on doing some of this, uh, this ornamental molding work, but uh, I couldn't really find a stone big enough. And then the question is, what do you do with that stone? I had a stone that was acceptable, and this could be used in a masonry wall or just put on a bookshelf for decoration. Uh, but it was suitable for doing the demonstrating uh, how things are done and how they were done back then with stone carving. And so uh, hopefully uh, we've created something that's interesting and informative, and that was our objective. Well, since last time Wayne was on my channel, uh, we went down to some old good things in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and he, we looked at all the stuff they got that they salvaged from churches and castles and what have you. That's awesome. And then he patched the bird bat. He got some limestone patch and patched the bird bat, which is real interesting. And he also carved this. So tune into Wayne's channel and subscribe because if you're a stonemason, you gotta know this kind of stuff, how they did it and created it. 
So we're going to be doing a lot of stuff in the future. And he also has a website, right, yeah. Wing? www.fareestudios.com. And his YouTube channel is? Wayne Faree. Wayne Faree YouTube. YouTube channel. So thanks for watching. Until next video. Thank you.